As we get started with the message this morning, I'm going to be turning your attention to John chapter 16, the next verses that we'll be looking at. And as you're turning in your Bibles there, I would have a question for you to think about today. And the question is, how do you evaluate what would be to your advantage? Now, that's a really general question, but how do you evaluate what would be to your advantage? Of course, there are a lot of different ways of taking a, a question like that. If you're a ball player, there are certain things that if you were a little taller, a little heavier, a little faster, a little this, a little that, it would be to your advantage and you'd be able to play your part just a little bit better. If you were a chess player, it would be to your advantage if you could just think further ahead in terms of more plays down the line, and unless, unless you're at the master level, but even then you'd still be able to come up with some things that would be to your advantage. But I'd like to refine the question slightly and say more specifically, what would be to your advantage when you are overcome with emotion? What would help you in times like that when you are really, for whatever the reason, you are just overcome with emotion at that particular time? It's something to think about in terms of how you would answer that question. What would be to your advantage at that time? In the passage that we're looking at this morning in John chapter 16, in verse 5, Jesus says to his disciples, But now I'm going to, but now I am going to, excuse me, but now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? I'm going to stop right there for a second, because if you've been with us over the last few weeks, you know that Earlier in this chap in the previous chapter, Peter asked that exact question, Lord, where are you going? And not too many verses after that, we found Thomas asking this similar question, we don't know where you're going. And so when we get to this particular verse, some people have been troubled by it, figuring out what's going on. Why is John saying that Jesus asks the disciples or makes the comment, none of you are asking me where I'm going. And I'd like to suggest that part of the answer comes from the fact that we can ask a question and have different things on our mind. As we looked previously at the end of chapter 13, where Peter said, Lord, where are you going? Chapter 13, verse 36. And Peter then went on and said, I'm going to go wherever you go. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're going to deny me. And then Jesus began in chapter 14, verse 1, to present a whole chapter full of encouragement for his disciples. I would suggest that when Peter asked the question, where are you going, it might very well have been like a boy who was told by his father they were going to do something special on a particular Saturday. And for whatever the reason, something came up, and the father had to say to his son, I'm sorry, son, but we can't do that today because I have this other business I have to take care of. And the son says, well, where are you going? And when the son asked that question in that situation, he doesn't really care exactly what the destination is his father is going to. His burden of heart is the fact that we're not going to get to do what I thought we were going to do together, whether it's go fishing or ball game or whatever it was. And his heart might have been the fact that he was disappointed and he's concerned and he's emotional. Of, he's, he wishes his father would be able to do that. And all he stumbles out of there was, well, where are you going? Well, what is it that's taking more attention that's going to pull me away? It's not really the destination that matters. the fact that we're not going to go and we're not going to do what we thought we were. And I would suggest that when Peter asked this question, where are you going? It's because for him, as I shared several weeks ago when I looked at the passage, for the disciples, if Jesus is going away, they've invested their lives for the last several years as his disciples following him and looking to him. They can't help but ask the question in their minds, well, if Jesus goes away, then what's the future for us? What's next? If he's going to go away, are we ever going to see him again? And Jesus answers those questions. My point in making that is that Jesus is quite well aware of what their emotions are, and we can see it even in our text today in the very next verses. Jesus in chapter 16, after he says, no one asked me where I'm going, when Jesus says that, he is referring to the fact that no one is asking him from a theological perspective, from a real interest in his destination where he's going. They're concerned about, from their emotions, what does the future hold for us? And we can see that Jesus has that insight into their hearts in the very next verse. Verse 6 says, But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Jesus was very, very much aware of what was going on in his disciples' hearts. He was reading their hearts. In fact, all of chapter 14, when he gives the different 
uh, encouragements. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come again. And he, he gives all those encouragements. He was reading their heart. He was responding to their heart. He was settling the issue for them as much as he could in terms of what the future would involve for them going forward as he would be taken away from them. But as they are in this situation, as we look at this, my question that I asked you at the beginning was, how would you evaluate that which would be to your advantage when you're overcome with emotion? I ask that question because if you're overcome with emotion, and as verse 6 says, sorrow has filled your heart, when you're in a state like that, I would suggest that you might answer the question by saying, it would be my advantage to receive comfort. It would be at my advantage when I'm overcome with emotion to have peace. It would be to my advantage when I'm overwhelmed with emotion to find some encouragement somehow something that's going to give me a reason to want to go on in the face of what's before me right now. It would be to my advantage when I'm overcome with emotion to have healing because that's what my soul really is longing for at that time. But very interestingly, Jesus in his next verse says, verse 7, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. And Jesus is now interestingly turning things in terms of what the future has and what is truly in the disciples' best interest. He already has spoken to what their emotional needs are. He's spoken to what their concerns are for the future and how he's preparing a place for them. He's dealt with all of that back in chapter 14. In chapter 15, he also has gone into giving them instruction for saying, this is how you're supposed to live. You have to abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. You can't have any fruit in your lives unless you abide in me. Unless you abide in me, you're going to be cast forth. You're not going to be able to have any fruit. You're going to wither and die. You won't have fruit in your lives whatsoever. So in John chapter 15, the first verses, Jesus speaks to that uh, question of how they are supposed to conduct themselves going forward. And then after that, Jesus then gives them instructions saying, Now, you also have to know that it's not going to be an all rosy picture for you going forward. And in the end of chapter 15, he talks about the persecution that they were going to face. We looked at that last week. And he says, you are going to face persecution. If you're a follower of mine, you will face persecution. It's not a question of if you will, but you will. You're going to face that. He was preparing the disciples for what was going to be coming in terms of persecution first at the hand of the religious leaders, the Jews, and later on at the empire and certainly by others in different places as the gospel was spread. And he was telling them that this is what you're going to be facing. Now he's saying, it is to your advantage that I go away. And Jesus is turning his discussion in a different direction at this particular point. He's turning it in the direction of what's going to be to their advantage from a different perspective. When our emotions and fears are dominating us, we may need to refocus on the power of God to advance the work of God. Let me say that again. When we are overwhelmed with our emotions, our fears, when they are dominating us, we may need to refocus on the power of God to advance the work of God. You see, in these verses that we're looking at in John chapter 16, Jesus is shifting from the internal focus and the meeting the needs of the hearts of the disciples to the fact that as he is going, there is the work of God that has to go forward. And he has to depart and leave them in order for God, the Holy Spirit, to come and to empower and to work in the ministry. For God to be using, for God, the Holy Spirit, rather, to be speaking a testimony to him. And he speaks in two different parts of what the ministry of the Holy Spirit will be doing. Now, it's very interesting because in other places, Jesus talks about how the Holy Spirit was the counselor, he was the encourager. He was the one that was going to comfort them, but not in this passage. If you look here at the description of what the Holy Spirit is going to be doing, the Holy Spirit is going to bring conviction on the world. The first unit is conviction. The second unit is how he's going to give testimony to disciples to tell them all things about him so they can understand. Two different units of what Jesus is describing the work of the Holy Spirit will be doing. But these verses... Do not speak to the felt needs, the comfort that we wish we could have, the comfort, the healing, the peace, 
the encouragement that you and I think we need when we're emotionally overwhelmed. Instead, Jesus is looking at the advance of the kingdom work of God here on earth. He is saying, it's to your advantage that I go away, because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit is not going to be here to do his work. Now, what's amazing is, is when we look over in the book of Acts, and we see what takes place at Pentecost and after Pentecost, and we see that the Holy Spirit empowers the disciples, and we'll be able to see in some of those verses, which we're going to look at a little bit later, that he gives the disciples instruction and understanding about who Jesus is and about what his ministry has been in ways that they haven't caught yet, that they haven't understood. As we look at the Gospels, we do not get the impression that at this point in Jesus' ministry, on the eve of his crucifixion, that the disciples have fully grasped that Jesus has to be the suffering Messiah, that has to die and has to bear the sins of mankind in his body on the cross, and then he would also rise from the grave, overcome death, and who would pay for their sins. They don't have that full picture. And Jesus is saying, I have more that I want to tell you, but I can't tell you anymore right now. You're not ready for that. Verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Verse 12 is another verse that indicates Jesus was reading the hearts of the disciples. He was reading their hearts and he knew they had had enough. You know, we use the expression sometimes of TMI, too much information. Sometimes we can tell people more than they can soak in or take at a time. If you're trying to instruct someone how to do something, and the person is like totally clueless where you're even coming from. Um, sometimes you can hit that too much information really, really quickly. Try teaching someone how to do something on the computer who has never used a computer before. And they sort of are glazed over in terms of, I don't know, here, click here, click there. All of you young people, when you try to teach us older folks how to do things, you can click on things just so fast our thumbs can't even, our eyes can't even see where your thumbs are going for some of the time, those things you do. We can't follow you and we get this glazed over look on our face. It's like Jesus would say, I have many things to say to you now, but you cannot bear them now. Um, we can't take it in. And Jesus has this sensitivity to the disciples that they cannot fully take in all of what's going to take place in the coming days. They're not ready right now. But take a look at Acts. When Peter preaches at Pentecost, he's got it nailed. And he hits it in his sermon on Pentecost, and boom, 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 boom. He lines everything up, explains it, and it's all very easily understood. What's very interesting, and this is not mentioned because it's behind the scenes, we don't see it, is that that's the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is describing right here. God the Holy Spirit has helped Peter connect the dots and understand everything so that by the time he gets to Pentecost and he preaches, Peter understands and he preaches a wonderful sermon there at that particular time. We also see that God brings conviction as he speaks about here. He says, when I send the Holy Spirit, when he comes, verse 8, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. As we look at these verses, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit is going to be accomplishing something in the world that he has to work in hearts. Now I want you to think about, think about this with me. If Peter preached his sermon, if Paul preached his sermon, if Stephen preached his sermon, no matter how great they were as recorded in the book of Acts, if any of them preached their sermons, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting the hearts of those that were listening, it could have just fallen over. Look at what they've done to Christ. They've rejected his own testimony to himself. He came to give the words of the Father. They've rejected, they've refused to listen to him. Only a small, small handful of people are his followers at this point. And Jesus is saying that, it's to your advantage for the work that you're going to carry on to be my testimonies that the Holy Spirit is going to come and he will bring the conviction in the hearts and the lives. And so Jesus is identifying here what the work of the Holy Spirit is going to be, not in terms of pouring a bomb on their grief-stricken hearts, but in terms of empowering them for what comes next and where they're going to have to take the baton and run with it in terms of carrying the testimony of the gospel.
he speaks about that. The summary of these chapters is that the cause for today's sorrow may be necessary for tomorrow's enablement. That's what we can see in these verses. The cause for today's sorrow is his departure, but it's necessary for tomorrow's enablement by the Holy Spirit. It's necessary to complete and accomplish the Lord's work. That's verses 6 through 15. And Jesus' departure was necessary for the Holy Spirit to give testimony to the Son. Jesus' departure, he had to leave in order for the testimony of the Holy Spirit to teach the disciples so they fully understood Christ's full work of the sac being the sacrifice, of being the Lamb of Isaiah, of being that perfect sacrifice to fulfill all the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. He was the perfect one, and the Holy Spirit had to give instruction to him. Excuse me, had to give instruction to Peter and to Paul, to the writer of Hebrews, to all of them. They had to be instructed by God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus' departure was necessary for the Holy Spirit to give testimony of the Son. And this would be the background for the disciples' ministry, which we can see in the book of Acts. So when we look at these verses, just to put it in perspective, Jesus is not just speaking to the felt needs of the disciples. He's already spoken to that in chapter 14. He's given them all sorts of answers for why they are concerned about him going away. But what Jesus is doing here is he's giving them instruction for how the testimony of the Father, the work of the Father, the advancement of the kingdom of God work on earth was going to go forward and it was going to be accomplished by the Holy Spirit. And he was going to be taking it further, taking it beyond, empowering the disciples so that they could be testimonies for him. And it was absolutely essential. It was to their advantage that he go and they didn't fully understand what that meant to go. They didn't fully comprehend it would mean that he would be crucified on the cross. They didn't understand that he was going to be, they didn't fully understand all the details, that he would be in the grave for the three days. They didn't fully understand how he would rise victorious from the, from the grave. And they didn't understand, as we see later on, his ascension into heaven and how he would go back to be with the Father. They didn't understand all of that. But they needed the Holy Spirit to teach them, to instruct them. The Holy Spirit would advance the testimony of God to the world in conviction. We can see that in verses 8 through 11. He was going to bring conviction upon sin because they did not believe in Jesus. If you turn back in your Bibles to John chapter 3, in John chapter 3, you all know the familiar verse 16, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to, con to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. For who he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But that's not something that just comes intuitive to people to understand. It requires the conviction of the Holy Spirit to bring people to the point that they realize that they must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and in believing have life through his name. It doesn't just come by thinking about that and eventually they happen to get it worked out in their own brain that this is who Jesus is. It's a result of God the Holy Spirit bringing conviction for sin. The sin is rejecting Jesus as God the Son, as the only means for salvation. And so when, God, when Jesus says he's going to bring conviction concerning sin, verse 9, it's because they do not believe in me. This is the sin. I'd also suggest that many of you are praying and you're burdened and concerned for loved ones and family members and people that you know, people that you've had occasion to have contact with, and you pray that they will turn their hearts upon to the Lord, that they will trust in him. We need to, you need to also be praying. This is the work of God the Holy Spirit to bring conviction for sin. And you have to pray for God the Holy Spirit to bring conviction in their lives, to draw them to himself, to draw them to God, to birth them into being saved to bring them into the family of God. You can't do it, and you can't pour enough guilt on their heads to do it, 
from your own human level and whatever you might say or whatever you might try to pressure them, don't waste your time trying to pressure them. God the Holy Spirit is the one that's qualified, that's enabled, that is given for that person purpose. And we need to be praying for God the Spirit to work in the hearts of people for whom we're concerned for their salvation. This is what, and this is the advantage. This is the point that Jesus is making. I have to go away. I'll be doing the work on the cross of redeeming, of paying the, the sin sacrifice for the penalty of mankind. I'll be doing all of that, that you might be justified, declared right in God's sight. And I'm going to pay and I'm going to be in the grave for three days. I can't tell you all that right now. That's more than you're ready for. You can't take it. But that's what he means when he says, I have to go away. But the Holy Spirit will come. And you need him because God the Holy Spirit's the one that has to convict hearts. God the Holy Spirit's the one that has to take my testimony and the testimony of my Father. And the words that the Father has given me that I'm giving to you, God the Holy Spirit has to drive that home to hearts. He's the one that has to do that. And it's to your advantage that I go, that he come, that he fulfill this ministry. He goes on and says, and of righteousness. We speak about righteousness, and you wonder, well, how will you get convicted of righteousness? I'd like to remind you that back in, earlier in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says that you need to judge righteous judgment because they were passing judgment on him and considering that he couldn't be of God, that his works were not from God the Father. And Jesus uh, makes the point in John chapter 7, uh, verse 24, do not judge according to the appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. You see, they were judging based upon their own way of, elab of evaluating things. They couldn't believe that Jesus could possibly have been God. They said, you're just the son of Joseph and Mary, who your parents, we know who they are. Uh, you can't possibly be God the son. You claim to be the bread from heaven. You claim to be the water of life. You claim all these things. You can't possibly be. You're just lying to us. You're misrepresenting things. We can't follow you. And in all these things, they are passing judgment on him. And Jesus is saying when the Holy Spirit comes, then he's going to bring judgment and he's going to bring condemnation because their judgment has not been righteous, but he'll bring judgment in terms of correct righteousness. God's standard, not yours. Not what it appears to you with your eyes, but what God has revealed by truth. And a contrary to the ruler of this world, the end of verse 11, the ruler of this world has been judged, and he has been judged a liar and a deceiver from the very beginning. And so all of their beliefs about who Jesus was that were incorrect, Jesus was saying, when God the Holy Spirit brings, he comes, he will bring conviction for the past judgments that you've incorrectly passed upon me, and you will be held guilty because the prince of this world is judged. And then we go on the second part. First he was giving judgment, but then the second part he'll give instruction to his disciples. The Holy Spirit will advance the testimony of God to the disciples by the way, that's the key of what's going on here. The Holy Spirit will advance the testimony of God. We can see it in the first section with bringing conviction, and the second part in terms of giving instruction to the disciples. And when Jesus gets to the end of this second section, he also points out the fact that all that I have said, I, come from, I get from the Father. And all that comes from the Father, the Holy Spirit is going to be giving to you. Verse 12. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he'll disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Jesus goes, has described here the work that the Holy Spirit is going to be doing in terms of communicating the truth. You know from the passages that we've looked at previously that Jesus has pointed out again and again, these are not my words. These aren't just what I'm coming up with. This is the Father has given this to me. I share the Father's uh, will to, word to you. And over and over again, he's testified that these aren't, this is not of me. It comes from my Father. It's his work. It's his words. That's what I'm communicating to you. And now Jesus is saying, as though the baton is being passed again, the Holy Spirit is going to be reiterating the same thing that came from me that I gave, that I had from the Father. 
He is going to be presenting this to you so you fully understand all of that. And so we can see in these verses that Jesus is talking about the work then of the Holy Spirit. But I'd like for us to turn over here in just the next few minutes to the book of Acts and see how this works itself out. What Jesus said will take place for the Holy Spirit teaching the disciples happens between chap John chapter 16 and what we see take place in the book of Acts. Now, Jesus did have additional time to teach them and instruct them after the resurrection. We can see that there at the end of the Gospel of John. We can see that in other Gospels as well. But in Acts chapter 2, we have Peter's sermon. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Peter speaks to the children of Israel, and he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. And we'll stop just for a second there. Back in John chapter 15, Jesus has said, You have seen the things that I have done that no one else has done, and you're condemned and held accountable because you didn't respond to what you've seen happen. And so John, Peter is picking up on that. You saw the miracles. You can't deny those. Verse 23. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of, knowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I'm, going to, I'm not going to read the next verses quoting from this, uh, David, because in the interest of time we need to go forward. But the point is that Peter understands now. Peter's well aware of how, the whole, how it all fits together. And Peter proclaims the knowledge of Jesus Christ the Son that's been given to him by the impartation of the Holy Spirit of which Jesus spoke there in John chapter 16. The Holy Spirit has fulfilled his work in teaching Peter about Christ's ministry. So Peter can now deliver this message with tremendous power at Pentecost. We also can see conviction if you go down to chapter 2, verse 37. Acts 2, 37. And when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I particularly want to point out verse 37 where in verse 37 it says that they were pierced to the heart. That's the other work of the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit taught the disciples. Peter preached the message as he was taught by the Holy Spirit after Christ's work on the cross. And now the Holy Spirit is working to drive home the message to hearts so that people would believe and trust in him. We can turn over also to Acts chapter 4, where... Peter and the other disciples are brought before the Jewish leaders. In verses 10 and 11 and 12, Acts chapter 4, verse 10, Peter says, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised by, from the dead, by this name this man stands before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, and which became the chief cornerstone. As he is defiant, as he is bold, as he is deliberate before the religious leaders of the day, Peter boldly proclaims what he knows about who Jesus is. And then further down, if you look at verses 7 and 8, I'm sorry, not further down, but actually up above it, uh, verse 7 and 8, when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power and what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and that's where he goes into it after that. So we find the apostles empowered by the Holy Spirit, instructed by the Holy Spirit, preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, and conviction taking place because of God the Holy Spirit working. We could look also uh, at the results here in this particular chapter, the conviction uh, in the end of this chapter. And we can look at Stephen's ministry and his long sermon that he preached. He preached and he gave a history of God working to the children of Israel, uh, going down through time. And ultimately, 
Uh, Stephen brings that to a conclusion in verses 51 through 54. And Stephen says to them, you men who are, this is Acts 7, uh, 51. Stephen says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You have received the laws that are ordained by the angels, and yet you did not keep it. There is boldness there, and he preaches with great boldness. And in verse 54, they were cut to the heart. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. And we find out, of course, he was crucified right after this. He was killed at this time. Well, what we see in these passages is fulfillment of what Jesus said back in John chapter 16. It was for their advantage that he go away. And if he went away, God the Holy Spirit would come. Now let's go back to where I began this morning. At the beginning, I asked you, to what, how do you evaluate what is to your advantage? Um, as particularly, how do you evaluate what's to your advantage when you're overcome with emotion? And I'd like to suggest that we naturally like the disciples, want to nurse our wounds, feel sorry for ourselves, be calmed, be placated, be encouraged, be comforted, be made peaceful, be helped. We want that warm blanket is what we are looking for. But there are some times that it's to our advantage that we have to take the testimony of the Lord and go forward, even in times like that. And after Jesus had met the needs of the disciples emotionally in chapter 14, he was now was saying, now, what's more important than your, how you're feeling on the inside is the advance of the work of God. And for the work of God to go forward, I must go to the cross and leave you. And the Spirit's going to come and testify. And the Holy Spirit's going to give testimony through you for me. Going back to John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, Jesus said in that passage, When the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me, and you will testify also, because you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus was already thinking ahead of this when he spoke that back in chapter 15 at the, in the preceding verses. He was saying, The Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to testify of me, and you're going to testify of me. And sometimes when we might be inclined to feel sorry for ourselves, to lick our wounds, to want to just find comfort in a hole someplace, God would say, it's to your advantage for you to take my kingdom work forward. And I'm going to give you the spirit and empower and enable you for that. Think about Paul, when he asked the Lord three times for the thorn in his flesh to be removed from him, Paul envisioned that he could do so much more effectively for God if God would just take that thorn away. As we could many times say, God, if you would just take this away, we want that warm blanket, we want that peace, we want the good feelings inside, the vibes, we want those on the inside. But God said to Paul, no. My grace is sufficient for you in this hour at this time. And we sometimes need to come to God and recognize his grace is necessary in our hearts to do the work and have the testimony for God even when we're down, even when we're emotionally distraught, and when we are at our wit's end and feel like we just can't take anymore. God would then choose to show his grace is sufficient. And his grace will be sufficient for you and for me. Whoever, wherever you are may be, you might face that point whereby you're overwhelmed, overcome with emotion, and you really, really would like to do nothing better than to just be like a bird and fly to the mountains, like David says in one of the Psalms. Just get away from it all. That's, at least I can have peace there. And God might say, no, my child, I want to give you grace to go through this hour, and I will use you as a testimony for me, even as you go through this hour and this ordeal now.
and you will accomplish my will by my strength and by my grace. And I'll use you as a testimony like I couldn't in any other way apart from you going through this particular hour. And so when we look at what Jesus' answer to his disciples are, as they're overcome with emotion, as he knows that, he says in verse 6, I have more things to say, but sorrow has filled your heart. He says sorrow has filled your heart and says it's to your advantage that I go away. My kingdom work will be advanced by my departure and work on the cross and by your empowerment in your weakness by the Spirit whom I'm sending, who will give conviction upon your hearers and instruction to your hearts and minds so that you can clearly communicate all that the Father has given from me. That's a summary of the verses that we looked at. And the challenge I would give to you today is that as we look at this, sometimes... We need to come to the Lord to find his grace in time of need, and he's promised that it'll be there. We can come boldly before his throne to find grace to help in time of need. We would just as soon step out of the storm, but he says, no, I'm going to give you grace to go through the storm. We would just as soon have our, the warm blanket and the warm spot where we can just find respite and he says, no, I'm going to empower and use you in this particular place for my glory going forward. That my kingdom work advance. And I will say that later when we look back, millennia future, hundreds of years future, who knows, we'll look back and say, it was worth it all because of how God's work was advanced through us in our times of weakness. Let's close in a word of prayer. God, I pray that as we would consider Jesus' sensitivity to his disciples' needs, but his even greater sensitivity to the advancement of your kingdom work, help us, I pray, to have a bit of the vision that Jesus was imparting to his disciples in this hour. Though overcome with sorrow, with grief, with concern, he challenged them that it was to their advantage for him to go, the very thing that they feared the most, because it would allow for the advancement of your kingdom work and testimony by the work of your Holy Spirit, empowering them in their weakness to carry the gospel to the religious leaders that were opposing them in the book of Acts, and eventually through Paul and the other missionaries throughout the Roman Empire. I pray, Father, that we might learn to turn to you for that grace to help in time of need and recognize that it's the work of your Holy Spirit to teach and instruct us and to bring conviction in the hearts of those for whom we are burdened and concerned. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.